This is the 2022 Top Fuel 9.9 XX1 AXS. I think that's it. This is probably one of Trek's most important models in recent years. It sort of follows this trend of down country bikes, lightweight short travel bikes. And this bike is very different from previous years top fuel. It sort of eats into the fuel EX space a little bit, at least if you look at the geometry. The travel now is 120 in the front and in the rear, but you can upgrade your top fuel with the 130 mm fork up front and still keep your warranty intact. Now this is the top end version of the top fuel and it costs around 13,000 euros, something like that. And I'm not even going to comment the price on this bike. If you want to have the best of the best, uh, this is it. But I'll try to look through the bling and uh, all the nice features that this bike has and try to see what this bike actually is about. The top fuel comes in very many different models, both in aluminium and in carbon. And I actually did test the top fuel eight six months ago, just for a quick ride. But that tells me that the feeling between the lesser models and the bling models are quite the same. So this is a truly modern bike. If you look at the geometry and if you look at the capabilities of this bike. The head angle is at a fairly slack 66 degrees for all sizes. The reach is rather long at 480 millimeters in size large and the chainstay length remains at 435 mm as with the previous top view. All solid numbers for a short travel trail bike. I am 185 cm tall and size large is spot on for me. The medium large felt just a little bit too short, but it could work with some minor adjustments. But what stands out with this bike is how well it pedals. Both the aluminium version and the carbon version, they pedal about the same. So they're both super efficient uphill and there's absolutely no pedal bump at all when sitting down. And I remember when I was this testing the Top Fuel 8, I thought I had engaged the lockout. And the rear suspension is almost as if it is in a uh, lock mode. I actually need to, to check that. No, it was correct. But it turned out that this was just a really good climber. And I don't know if it climbs that well because of that ABP system or if it's because of these pivot points up in the front there. We'll get back to that later. But one thing that makes me scratch my head a bit is that low front end over there. And let me show you. Now the front end of this bike, the stack height that is, is actually lower than on the Specialized Epic Evo, which really leans into the cross-country segment a little bit more. And I thought that was a little bit interesting because I think this is more a trail bike than the Specialized Epic Evo. Personally, I like a higher front end because of the confidence it provides for me as an average mountain biker in the descents. But there are ways that you can fix this. By adding spacers below the handlebars, you will change your position on the bike quite significantly. So I've just added some spacers below the handlebar here and the only thing I need to do now is to tighten the handlebar and since this is carbon all over I need to tighten it really really tight. <laughs> yeah, seems to be some sort of a manufacturing fault. So how much is it then? No, I'll fix it. I'm a professional, goddammit. So for me, this transforms this bike into something a little bit more capable. And these spacers add about three centimeters. That is quite a lot, actually. Let's talk about suspension here for a little bit. Up front, it's a RockShox SID Ultimate, and that Ultimate means that it's got a race day damper, which is a quite new damper replacing the older Charger damper. There is a new kid on the block in the SID fork range. The base SID fork, which can be found on the Top Fuel 8, has got the all new Rush RL damper. Little is known about this damper, and there are no reviews out yet at the time of making this video. 
From studying the service manual, it looks fairly similar to the standard charger damper. But don't quote me on this, these are all speculations. The SID Select has got the Charger RL damper, and the SID Select Plus has got the newer Charger 2 RL damper. And finally, the SID Ultimate, which is fitted to this bike, has got the almost new Race Day damper, which is very lightweight and has also got a solid lockout. The 120mm of the SID fork has got 35mm stanchions, but it's also got a wider stance as well, and it can accommodate for 2.6 inch wheels, according to RockShox. But I think 2.6 is a bit of a stretch, especially if you want to keep a mud guard here and have some mud clearance as well for Nordic conditions. 2.5 maybe. I really like this fork and it's sturdy enough for rough terrain and believe me I have tried it. But there's one small question mark and this fork came out about two years ago or something like that. And that question mark is about reliability. RockShox have had some problems with bushing play in these forks. And that's something you can fix yourself, but it's not that easy to do that. And without knowing, I really hope that RockShox have fixed these problems with this fork. Back here, it's not the SID shock, uh, which surprised me a bit. Maybe that's too cross-country for this bike. But this Deluxe shock's got this RCT damper in this Ultimate version. As with many other bikes, there's a flip chip down here to tweak the geometry a little bit. And there is some wizardry going on here in the rear end. The ABP parts is a chapter in itself. Another interesting thing about the rear suspension are these pivot points over here. And usually with this type of suspension, this rear triangle, these pivot points are positioned further rearwards. But on this bike, everything sits in front of the bottom bracket. Just to clarify, the ABP system aims to separate the rear braking force from the rear suspension. By using a concentric dropout pivot at the rear axle, Trek can mount the brake caliper on the seat stay. Since the seat stay rotates less than the chain stay throughout the suspension travel, this will almost eliminate any so-called anti-rise effect. In other words, the rear suspension will not firm up when using the rear brake. I suspect that the ABP system has little effect on the pedaling efficiency but it must work in conjunction to other suspension systems. The forward plate suspension linkage is probably what affects the pedaling performance the most. From what I understand, this design helps keeping a consistent anti-squat throughout the travel. This is a very nice and well executed addition to this bike. And this is actually a very large compartment. And inside this compartment there is this little case. And I guess it's there to not damage the carbon frame. Now the drivetrain of this bike is very special of course. It's the XX1 AXS system, the wireless system. I'm not going to talk too much about it, but it shifts very well of course, and it's very lightweight and it's made out of exotic materials. But I do think the GX drivetrain shifts equally as well. I've tested that on a couple of other bikes and I will go through the AXS wireless system in another video a little bit later, if you're interested in that. So great range and flawless shifting, there's nothing else to be desired. And this bike has got that new shifter, which is a welcome addition which ergonomically feels a little bit better. And there's an app as well, of course, to tweak some settings like what button is up and down and to tweak the indexing as well. So there's a lot of adjustment possibilities, but I think as soon as you set up everything once, you can forget about that app and just enjoy flawless shifting, at least until the battery runs out. So the brakes on this bike are the SRAM G2 brakes. These are the ultimate edition. They've got carbon fiber levers and there are bearings rather than bushings down here. And it's got some adjustments as well, of course, to adjust the bite point and uh, lever stroke, etc. Now the G2 brakes replace the guide brakes and this is sort of the second generation of guide brakes. And I think these brakes are a mixed bag really. It's got great adjustment possibilities, of course, and SRAM has improved everything about these brakes and uh, moved the bar up a little bit from the guide. But it's not the revolution. I prefer the code brakes, but I think these brakes are here because of the weight. 
I personally like the code brakes a little bit more because there's a lot more bite to them. There is enough braking power for this bike with these brakes, but you need to pull these levers a little bit harder to make it stop. The tires on this bike are the popular in-house brand Bontrager XR4s, which is a clear step towards trail tires than what used to come with the top fuel. The XR range is still within the cross-country segment, so don't expect enduro-like performance, but rather a fast-rolling all-round trail tire. I think the tires also explain the weight of this bike, which sits around 11.3 kilos in this top-end version. I know that some complain about that the weight of some of the top fuels exceed the weight of the Bigger Brother Fuel EX, but I'm not too concerned about that. First of all, the geometry and the sheer size of the frame is probably one explanation for the weight increase. And of course, chunkier tires add to the weight too. All in favor for a more durable and confidence-inspiring bike. It's still a very snappy bike, it's quick to accelerate and easy to maneuver. I almost forgot about the dropper, and this shows that not even Trek is immune to the global component crisis in the world. And uh, this bike has actually got a RockShox reverb dropper, it works perfectly fine, but it should come with the AXS dropper, uh, which this bike doesn't have. I saw another bike at Trek store in Gothenburg, which is identical to this bike, and that bike did have an AXS dropper. But right here is a normal reverb. Here are three annoying things with the Trek top fuel. This saddle and I, we are not friends. A personal thing of course, but I have tested bikes with this saddle a few times and it doesn't get any better. A lovely fork which sits perfect on this bike. I just hope that RockShox can get to grips with the problems around bushings play. I just have to comment the 13,000 euro price tag, don't I? Luckily, the prices start from a more reasonable 2,800 euros for a Top Fuel 5. Here are three good things with the Trek Top Fuel. This is a bike that follows the winning concept of great geometry and snappy suspension. That's a recipe for loads of fun in almost any terrain. A minor detail perhaps, but this is such a useful storage that doubles as a bottle holder. All bikes should have something like this. The AXS drivetrain cleans up the cockpit and makes for flawless shift every time. Not a necessity, just very, very nice. As you probably can tell, I've truly enjoyed riding this bike for the past month. I only have a few minor complaints, but the most important part in a modern trail bike are there. And that's the geometry, how the bike rides, and also how very efficient it pedals. To me, it's important how confidence inspiring a bike is and how fun it is to ride. And the new top fuel ticks both boxes.